Right, there we go, 12.30. I sit there staring at a clock, which is it's amazing how long it takes from 12.29 to 12.30. Could I just ask there, my co-hosts, brilliant, to put their cameras on. Phil, you are the last man standing hunting for that camera image. Uh, if you can just press, there we go. Well done, gold star. Um, thank you for everybody who's joining. My name's Helen, uh, COO here at Futurely. Um, I will introduce my co-hosts shortly, uh, but we just have a tiny piece of housekeeping to do before that. One, I just want to check that everyone can hear me. So co-host, if you can thumbs up, but also if we can have thumbs up uh, or a chat box message from everybody to let me know that you can also see my screen and I should have some slides on the screen. Um, now I want you to find that chat box, one to tell me that you can see my screen, but also so that you know where to ask questions of the team later on. This is where nobody's chatting to me. Please can someone chat to me? Anyone, as you're dialing in to send a chat message, I just say that, yes, there we go, everyone's found it. Right, now that you all have found it, that is where to ping your questions in as we go through the session today. Um, I did, I was on LinkedIn yesterday and somebody said, it's a terrible thing to leave Q&A till the end. Um, but then I also think it can be really disjointed if we don't. So I'll keep my eye on the questions that we go through and there's something really relevant, I'll bring it, uh, the questions uh, to that slide. If not, I will cover them all off at the end. Um, we are also all at home, as you all know, the reason that we're hosting these is obviously because of COVID and lockdown. So please note, we're all on home Wi-Fi. Um, we've all got animals and husbands and children's, children's, <laughs> children. Um, I also have builders who are coming backwards and forwards past me, which is brilliant. Um, so just we'll go with it as it, as it goes uh, throughout the session. We are recording this session. We will be sharing it with everybody um, who has registered. So if you are an accountant who wants to share it out with, with any of the recruitment firms you work with, or if you're a recruitment agency who wants to share it with the team, you will be able to, you'll get it before the end of the day. Um, just to quickly set the scene, and then I will stop talking, I promise. Um, each week here at Futurely, we are looking at a different vertical, an industry vertical, um, and talking to those businesses within that vertical. Um, this week, we're talking recruitment, a place very close to my own heart, having come up through the recruitment background. Um, but I think most agencies are staring down the barrel of hiring freezes, job cuts, and of course, the looming recession. Um, it all sounds horribly bleak. But we've joined today uh, by the brilliant uh, tech recruiters, James Chase, two of the team from James Chase, who are going to tell us not all bleak and how they're actually going to manoeuvre their, their, their business through it and how they're going to come out stronger. Mm -hmm. Without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to them. So uh, if we can there, see, I'm going to pass to Hannah first, my co-host. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, Hannah, and explain why it has the two of us on the call, maybe. Uh, yes, well, we seem to do everything in the team. So we're basically a double act, Anton Deck, watch yourself. Um, but uh, my, um, as a CEO of Futurely, my passion is small businesses. So ensuring that they're all right, basically, they're all right. Um, they can navigate their the storm, they understand where they're going, they can make really uh, great decisions and choices about what they do because they've got predicted information at hand. Helen comes at it from the accountant's perspective, because of course, if we pincer movement, and make sure that our accountants um, are fully, you know, um, stacked up with all of the tools uh, that they need um, and can have to help uh, inform better conversations and advise their clients and help their clients, um, then all well and good. You know, we, we manage to serve uh, the majority of small businesses out there. So we'll have accountants and small businesses on the call today. And with that, I would like to introduce Phil. Hello, Phil. Hi, Hannah. How are you doing? Do you want to, do you, do you want to, you and Matt want to give a little bit, bit of background about yourselves and then we'll go into, um, next slide, we'll talk about the business. Sure, fantastic. Um, firstly, thank you guys. Thank you for inviting James Chase um, into this uh, review. Um, so uh, a bit of background on myself really and, and James Chase and who we are and then I'll um, move on to Matt and Matt can talk. So James Chase Solutions are based in Brighton. We have a, predominantly a, an IT uh, project office um, tech certainly recruitment organization we're based uh, near the um, clock tower um, in Brighton we uh, started 11 years ago so my background has been nearly 20 years in in IT recruitment working for two of the biggest biggest um, recruitment staffing firms in Europe across Europe learned the trade if you like from there and then set up James Chase with Steve Rackley who's the other co-owner so we set up 11 years ago and the reason behind it on a mission, I suppose, of that was we've learned a lot from where we worked in the past um, and we took lots of positives and 
and uh, like I've said, learn the trade. But from there, we we also learn other ways to do recruitment. So the focus really for James Chase, and it always has been, is really passionate of ours, is customer, our clients, who they are, what they want, what their beliefs are, and and we supply staff um, within tech and project, if you like, across the UK um, at uh, at a I suppose at a, a level with more of a relationships more than trying to get a quick win and a quick sale. So I like to think that our history is is a very honest, we're an honest recruitment firm. Um, our staff are extremely senior, like Matt himself. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. And um, yeah, we're, we're very passionate about our clients and, and our customers. I also just interject, Phil, before I let you talk, Matt, sorry. Um, is white your favorite color? Because <laughs> currently we have a white clock, a white wall, a white shirt, and even your profile picture is white. I've just, just seen, I've, I've just noticed it, it is a different it's shirt. Backwards. It's brilliant. <laughs> I've just noticed it is a different shirt, but I have quite another white shirt on. That's brilliant. I have got other that- clothes, I promise. Sorry, Matt, if you can just briefly, and Hannah, sorry, just can you speak up? I think your sound is a little bit scuppered today, Han. You do sound quite quiet. So we've had a couple of requests in for you to just bellow down your microphone if you can when you I when will it comes try. To yeah, it. certainly. Um, Matt, over to you, my friend. Can you just introduce yourself um, and a little bit bit history about you? Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us, guys. Um, so uh, as Phil mentioned, yeah, been in recruitment for 12 years now. I think looking back before preparing for this webinar, um, I got into recruitment in around 2008, 2009. So I picked my moments, definitely. Oh, great year. Yeah, but I was a mortgage broker before that. So I think I chose a, a slightly more uh, fruitful career, but despite being at challenging times. And um, background was in, in London, helping uh, London startup scene and high growth businesses to build uh, their engineering and product teams. Um, was also involved in the organization of uh, a bunch of networking and technology meetup events um, in, in London. Um, so that's where I cut my teeth. It was a, a competitive market back then, not perhaps as much as it is or it was over the last few years. Um, and then spent some time in North America, um, recruiting for technology companies in Dallas and Austin um, before moving back to London and becoming a little bit disorientated with the rat race and some of the culture of recruitment agencies within London. Um, I had the opportunity to come down to Brighton four years ago uh, where I joined uh, the guys at James Chase and saw lots of similarities between the Brighton technology startup scene and that which I walked into 12 uh, or so years ago in in London. Um, There was a real vibrancy about it, a real sense of community, um, one that I thought perhaps needed a little bit more injection, um, but there was definitely something that that I could bring and something that excited me about the city. Um, Fell in love with Brighton and yeah, been here for- How would you not? I mean, we all are very smug at this time of the year where it's 20 degrees, are we? taking my walk on the beach and some of my friends back home in London, I, I try not to okay. remind them where I am, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. And also even though the last four years, just seeing the growth of the city and some of the companies in that and the people within the community, um, yeah, it, it makes me think that this will be my home for a long time. So it's been great. Brilliant. And so this combining of forces, and you started, Phil, to tell us a little bit about the background of the business, but I guess um, just run through the numbers, I guess, that are associated with it. When did you exactly launch? I missed that. I'm sorry. I so, we, so we started in 2009, uh, okay. so we're in our 11th year now. Um, the, the mission is, uh, as I've said, really just to, to become a very honest, locally well-respected um, recruitment firm. Um, it's really important for us that I think I said to you on the phone, Helen, not long ago, you know, if we if we got we've got clients all over the UK and if if a client's asked us to deliver um some staff them for, for different skill sets that we may not be able to help, we'll we'll push them aside. We'll yeah, we'll put, yeah. we'll point them in another direction of another recruitment firm, just purely because we don't want to waste their time and I don't want it's really important for us and, and that our clients' time is is well spent on on um, us supplying staff. Yeah. That's slightly underpinned, isn't it? And we've got Silicon Brighton, which is just mm. there on the on the side, which I think is actually part of the mission and actually part of the thread that will be is in your survival strategy that we'll get to later on as to how you've worked through this. Mm. But it just explain what Silicon Brighton is and how it connects to the recruitment business itself. Yeah, so Silicon Brighton we launched midway through through last year um, to help bring together. Um, the local tech community and promote knowledge share collaboration 
and really helping um, that scene to thrive more than it was so already. There was a number of local meetup groups which were doing interesting things in small numbers. We wanted to try and do something that was perhaps a bit more inclusive um, and anything we could do to stimulate growth and, and knowledge share within Brighton then supported all of our efforts and all of our interests really. Um, so we had our first bunch of events last year which we um, got off the ground and we had around 100 to 125 people at each event, really well supported by a, an engaged community and some great speakers and some hard work from Steve and the team. Um, and it's been great. We've been able to showcase local businesses and who've been able to showcase their products, mm -hmm. share some of their success stories from, you know, things like raising funding, which people want to hear about or getting products to market, um, which then people can take away and put into practice at their own companies, as well as some more technology specific meetups, which might um, be a little bit uh, more attractive to some of the sort of hardcore technology people here that want to learn about new things or new practices as well. So essentially it was to bring the, the, the local community together to promote growth within Brighton yeah. and to help us as well upskill into certain areas that we felt um, our, our customers and, and our, our network could benefit from. Um, so yeah, they were all in-person events last year going really great and we quickly had the rug pulled from under us like many people. Yeah, we had to, yeah so what, what did 2020 look like beforehand? <laughs> what was it, what was it, what was the big vision? Were you growing? What was the, what yeah, absolutely. Like? yeah, absolutely. We had probably our most exciting start to, to a year for in recent memory, certainly. Business levels were, were great. Um, there was a lot of excitement, particularly in the local market, about investment into the city, new co-working spaces, companies growing. Um, we hired um three new people two or three new people towards the, the early part of the year to support that growth which we were experiencing um and up until i would say probably late february even early march we were still speaking to clients who were you know excited and buoyant about this year what it held and, and had big plans to um to, to grow and how we could support them so it started off very positively and just what were those numbers then? So how many, so just before we, the kind of world fell over, um, how many staff did you have across, you're just one office, aren't you, in Brighton? Just go yes, to the yes, yes, we've, yes, we've got the one office in Brighton. Um, we have, um, we, before this all started, we had a 19 staff. Um, we've lost three of those, we're down, we're down to 16 now in total. Um, we've, live jobs, we, I mean, we, we've, we, we've, always got live jobs on our on our cards and we're always working new and new and some even older jobs and stuff so that's always been at a high level however it has obviously dipped from let's say probably around april and i thought matt on it i'd have thought from april time it yeah. dipped, uh, dipped a little bit yeah i think we're probably from the beginning of the year to where we were in in mid-april probably 60 to 70 percent at least down on, on where we were in terms of requirements live requirements and um and business levels at, at least i would say we've probably and did you there. have did you have temps out working i mean how many or do you do you not have temps out working yeah so how so, many temps did you have out working roughly so roughly we've had anywhere around between 60 to 90 contractors out on site uh, roughly somewhere around that sort of figure that's obviously dropped quite heavily one of um uh, one of our main clients is one of the biggest airlines and obviously that's been hit drastically yes. so we had quite a number of contractors there and things so yeah it's um it's only taken taken a dip from that but we did <laughs> we did get up to about 90 contracts 100 maybe and so if you take a step back and go early indicators sorry no it's obviously fine <laughs> um, what what did you have any early indicators you know obviously we started you know it was the beginning of the year where we all started hearing about it you know what was happening around the world and so was there was there anything in your industry that you started going well, hold on a second this isn't this isn't what we forecast that was going to be happening. yeah we i mean I, I suppose really that airline um i think they were they were one of the first to make announcements of, of um, cuts cutting costs i think that the, the travel industry is really big in peak their peak time is january um and january they didn't have hardly any sales which means people was obviously not planning on going away um so that impacted them hard um so that i would have thought around that company along with a few other companies who put lots of freezes on recruitment i'd say around february and march for the roles that we're looking to bring in for April, May time. So obviously the, the start dates of what they were looking to get people in by and the time scales, because some, some pieces of equipment obviously three to six months long, 
as a project to bring them in, they delayed those. So we, that's when we started really noticing, yeah. And so, and so what actions did you, so, so did you just go, well, we'll just, we'll just kind of see what happens or did you actually go, hold on a second, we need to take some action ourselves to protect our business. What, what, what did you, you know, what did you take immediately? Yeah, so unfortunately we had to, we had to lose a couple of the, the staff, like, like I mentioned earlier, there's a, a few that we had to, to let go, who were the new staff in with us really, or some of them were. Um, we also um, obviously looked at the costs and things, which we'll go into a bit more later, but certainly we looked at the overall cost of what, you know, what, what impact this may have on us. But to be totally honest, when, when this all started around March time, I think March is one of our biggest months in, in mm -hmm. revenue. Um, from the activities that come through from the end of last year and, and the start of this year. It's only really started to impact over the, the last couple of months. Um, and how quickly did you, you said you lost a couple of staff, how quickly did you take that decision? Um, immediately really. I think once we knew that the impact the airline, the, the travel industry is having, yeah. and the financial impact we're going to get from that, um, I think we kind of realised then that we're going to be slowing down on, on a large percentage of our work. So um, we, we took immediate action. Okay, brilliant. Um, and from the temps, just on those temps, you said that you had between 60 and 90 temps out working. Did, was that one of the early indicators? Did they get exited from those companies they were in? So that got cold quite quickly? Not, not all of them, but about 50% of them did straight away or, or certainly seeing through into the end of April. And, and then course, and the volume of permanent jobs as well coming through? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're still really busy with that. Okay. Yeah, I think the steps of the contractors were the first first to go. Obviously, generally speaking, being the biggest cost to the business. Um, and unfortunately, um, as businesses began to take stock of how it would affect them, um, some of our permanent starters who had offers on the table and had already quit their jobs had those difficult decisions, uh, difficult conversations where their new positions were no longer available to them, which was really tricky for us to to deal with and how we could then try and help them with some of our other clients to make sure we could, could you know keep giving back to them really so it was a difficult time definitely just and as you come into lockdown i mean obviously from a sales environment and your own teams they've suddenly gone remote so you've obviously had to shut the office down you've got the teams that are sitting remotely how do you continue to engage with those team members encourage them to do the selling it's probably a really hard market so they're banging a lot of heads against walls how do you maintain that level of motivation during this this initial lockdown period? I think really for, 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 for the guys that, that are working, I mean, it's, it's in their best interests as well. I mean, the most important thing for us out of all of this is keeping their communication and, and keeping their network flowing. That's absolutely key. I mean, it, it's difficult times, obviously, because the last things people want to start hearing about is, is growing and hiring large amount of numbers into their teams. So obviously those conversations have completely changed. So we've learned a whole new way of of recruiting if you like but certainly we've learned a new way of talking to people about what their interests are now to just keep those channels going so i made it really um important for our staff to keep that channel going so those communications are constantly flowing and obviously as we come out of this you know we want them to be there the the, the the you know the conversations that they last remembered uh, we'll come in go sorry matt Sorry, I think, yeah, moving away from the mindset of a transactional recruitment business um, mm -hmm. and seeing what we could do more of that was good in the market. So how we could use our time, our knowledge and our advice to help candidates out there that didn't have anything at the moment, giving us, just giving them advice on CVs, giving them yeah, advice okay. on how to approach businesses um, and trying to be far more relationship driven and, and helping people for helping people's sake, rather than just thinking of the short term recruitment needs, really. But that does beg the big, fat, hairy question of financials. Um, it's all very well doing good and looking after everybody and, you know, kind of making sure everyone's okay. But ultimately, you've got to make the books balance. So, um, I mean, Phil, I assume you want to pick this one up. Talk to well, us. From the yeah, just, just from the cash flow perspective side of things and forecasting and modelling different outcomes, you know, as this all went on and, you know, there's, there's already someone who's asked about furlough schemes and government, government mm -hmm. schemes and taking advantage of time to pay loans, all of those sorts of things. But at the beginning of it, it's that understanding of right, okay, listen, if this persists, what does the business look like? If it gets worse, what does it look like? You know, so how much of that have you been doing and, and kind of from what what point? So um certainly so that, so from the, the cash flow, yes, it has been impacted. I think it probably impacted everyone really. Um 
the the way that we, we used to have monthly meetings with our, our finance guys and we've got a, a business mentor business coach that works with us as well um so we used to have these monthly meetings with them there now over the last eight weeks they've since, well, since lockdown really they've, they've become more of a, a weekly meeting now do you want to keep our finger on the pulse of what's coming in and what's going out because that's really key um, so the decisions we've had to make around that really is is looking at what's going out on a daily basis and what's coming in on a daily basis rather than a, a monthly sort of decision now. Um, so we've we've um, those, those sort of financial discussions have been very very frequent because we need to we need to make sure that we we keep an eye of everything that's coming in and going out. And, and so what actions have you taken practical you know you've got people in your watching this webinar today who are in your industry you know to help your peers out what are the sorts of um, actions that you've taken on the cost sides of things so we've had a look at the um obviously the overheads and we've had a look at um uh, the um operational costs of the office because obviously we're not in, we're not in the office now so we've stopped a lot of the systems that are in the office that we use um, there's silly little things like the waters, you know, the water main coming in and the cleaners and the window cleaners. It all adds up, doesn't it? <laughs> it all adds up and, and that sort of stuff we've sort of put on hold until until we open again. Um, so we've, we've li literally looked at our outgoings and by every single thing and just, just gone through them one by one and just, just either cancelled or um, uh, put, pushed back. And have you done renegotiated with suppliers? Have you spoken to your landlord? Have there been practical things like that? No, no, we haven't. No, we our, our office is due for um, a renewal in August. So we've we've been there for uh, six years now. So we're going to time to renew in August. So we're going to be doing that when we're back in, I think, in July. But conversations around um, stopping the rent of the offices and stuff like that. We we've not had those those conversations because we haven't needed to, if you like. Okay. And have you and have you taken advantage of any of the government schemes? Only the furlough scheme. So we furloughed uh, half of the office in April. Um, and uh, yes, that's the only schemes we've taken advantage of. So there was a decision to actually lose staff in one instance and then others had been furloughed. Was that because you just didn't see any, any way back because of the, you know, the, the client being in the travel industry that, that they were servicing that side of the business? Or well, was it because yeah. the furlough schemes weren't available at that point and you had to make a decision at that time? Yeah, so the, the furlough scheme we took advantage of really because because recruitment has dropped heavily down. So our our delivery team, if you like, we've kept a few only a couple of our delivery team working. So the delivery team we've we've furloughed, and the people like Matt and people like that, the people that are out talking to their clients, and we want those communications to to continue. We 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 haven't furloughed those guys because it's really important for them that they carry on with their with their industry and they carry on with their with their with their network, if you like. Um, so it's more of the back office type guys that we've 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 we furloughed. So so weekly weekly forecasting, weekly adjustments, daily you know ch checking costs on a daily basis. Yeah. Obviously keeping abreast of the news and has things changed. Um, what what I mean, it seems like a stupid question, but what is keeping you up at night, both of you, at this juncture? We're just on the financial side of things. Um, I, I suppose really for me is 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 the mind of everyone really is is the way that how our staff are feeling, the ones that are furloughed, the ones that are not. Obviously, because this is impacting everyone in 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 different ways. Um, so I suppose really is to is forget the, the the running of the business and how the business costs are, are coming in and out. It's more of a case of really just making sure that we we come out of this bigger. If you like, and we come out of this in 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 the way that we're we're planning to do now, and we're planning it really well. So, I'd say really the the mindset of my, of of my staff really. Um, I think it probably takes us nicely to because there's kind of two phases that we've got to go through, and it's kind of you've done that initial one, you've reduced costs, you've saved where you can, you furloughed, you've exited staff that were too new in or working on specific projects that you knew you wouldn't be able to to, to salvage. Um, so you've done that bit of housekeeping. Now you're kind of into this today world where you're trying to keep the world, the wheels turning. Sounds like you've still got some jobs on. Matt, you did say that there's, you kind of got a new way of working. So maybe you just want to share everybody what it does, how you are working, what it looks like today. Yeah, I guess not, for me, it's not so much a, a new way of working. It's spending more time doing some of the work that um, might have been seen as a, as a bit of a longer game previously, really, and then trying to um, 
create um, you know mutual interest for people that I'm speaking to rather than just having a, a recruitment hat on. Um, I think in terms of it's difficult because the inability to plan and have a long-term strategy at the moment is it, it makes things as a salesperson or for a business that relies on um, uh, on kind of variable income difficult to, to plan and remain sort of calm and focused so um, I think trying to um, help the people where we can but also try and identify industries and markets that are proving to be quite buoyant at the moment and yeah. using those as a focus for us to be able to capitalize and get those quick wins that we need to survive in the short and midterm really. And how much has that taken you off piece? Because obviously you are tech recruiters, but where where is it taking you in identifying those other industries? So I think fortunately technology is always quite resilient in times like this because the way that businesses need to engage with their consumers these days relies mm -hmm. so heavily on technology that as businesses adapt and change, uh, whether they're moving things online or moving systems become more available because everyone's on them, um, there's always going to be, be the need for technology expertise in those spaces. Um, we have seen a lot of growth in areas like immersive technology, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, oh, wow. You have to get away from today. <laughs> <laughs> Put the goggles on. It's not yeah. here. <laughs> That's really like interesting. Archer, for sure. Um, and things like distance learning, mobile yeah. first companies. So nothing that is you know, brand new, but they've, they've seen a big uptake in their business levels because of the way in which they help companies to engage with consumers. So it's just mm -hmm. understanding more about those markets and aligning ourselves to them as much as we can, really. And interesting, to those companies that they've seen a boom, because I think there's been a very much boom or bust type response yeah. to industries. Those companies that are booming, are they hiring permanently for that boom or are they temporary hiring? So, yeah, so they're hiring permanently. Generally speaking, I think those which are experiencing the boom now don't think that their product will be any less successful once the world opens up a little bit more because they've already carved their niche and they're, they're pretty good at what they do. Um, but because there has been such a big inf influx in business levels or, or um, larger scope of projects for them, um, they're able to hire perm staff without worrying too much because they are experiencing that boom. Yeah. Um, there have been a few um, companies that have been a bit more conservative and are hired on a fixed term contract basis. So yeah. for 12 yeah. to 18 months to deliver particular products or services and then taking stock. I fully expect most of those people, if they do an, and do a good job, to be offered full-time contracts because they probably will be in a position in the market which will mean they'll be successful beyond that. Of course. Uh, and have you had to reduce your fees during this period? Has that come up for during conversation? We haven't reduced our fees. Look at Phil. Phil's going, no, no. no. <laughs> we haven't, haven't reduced our fees because the work that we still have to put in is still huge but we've been able to offer more flexible payment terms for yeah. experiencing difficulties but still have a need to hire. And one thing I didn't ask in the financial section, have you guys looked at the bounce back loans or the Corona business interruption loan scheme because it's a viable business you know that's been on the go since 2019 that has clearly been profit making you would absolutely qualify for the C-bills and equally you know bounce back as well. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's something we've discussed. It's, it's certainly something that we would still definitely consider if we needed to, if this, this continues, really. Um, but for now, uh, for now, it's, it's not something we've had to, to look into. In, it's into one of those things, right. cash in the bank, it's the de-risking. Rather have it and give it back than not have it at all. There is, there is that, because obviously, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an option there for us to get, have and we can give it back. And, I'm not saying that we would we wouldn't rule yeah. that um, wouldn't take it if we need it, but at the moment it isn't something we 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 need to get. Sure. And how are you um, measuring the team at the moment? I guess it's one for you, maybe Matt or Phil, either either. But of you know, from core business metrics is one thing, and I guess that's a question for you, Phil. But then I guess actual day to day metrics of ensuring that you are achieving what you need to achieve. What are you looking at? Yeah. So from from the business side, I mean, it, the metrics we know obviously that was the, the cash flow. Um, you know, we, we we're monitoring everything really, and we're, we're measuring everything. So so the overheads, the the the, the, the operational costs, the cash flow, um, and 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 obviously our customers as well. You know, we we really staying close to them to find out when they are going to start recruiting again. We need to be ready for when they are. You know, mm -hmm. the, the conversations we're having with them and, and what we're measuring now for the future really is looking at when we're going to start needing to bring our staff back out of furlough because we're going to need to use them instantly because it could it could be a turn and switch as, as quickly as that 
at the moment we we're ready and we um sorry we we we're, we're managing everything well with what we've got in the office mm -hmm. and that's working working well and smoothly i think when it comes to the stage where the switch will get turned if you like i think we we we're, we're there in a position to just go and help them there and then yeah. Matt, and, and how about from the consultant's perspective, is there anything specifically different that you're measuring them against? Um, I think just really focusing more on, on quality. Um, so if we're, um, and the quality of, of roles we're bringing in, the quality of the information we're getting for our candidates that we can present to positions and the information around market intelligence that then we can, we can act upon. Um, I think traditional, not that we're a, a KPI driven business, um, as some are in recruitment really, but traditional KPIs were, are pretty much gone out the window in terms of you know, how the, what business levels are obviously going to be way, way down. So it's more about the quality um, and the consistency of that communication. So we're still in touch with the market, still in touch with our customers. And I think the key is, is understanding. So understanding what our community and our candidates are going through, understanding what our clients are going through to allow us to be able to you know, offer the best advice that we can really. Um, there's one question that's come in, like, uh, back to the questions, time or not? Um, and actually, I think it's really pertinent just now. Caroline's asking, did you have to look at tech so that you could do virtual screening and helping clients with, you know, video interviews and things? Yeah, so we, we actually looked at that last year um, and we implemented... It it's, all that, it's all that VR, you know, you're ahead of time. Exactly. We can't, we, we, <laughs> we've got to pretend to know what we're doing. So. <laughs> no, we um we got a platform in last year actually, which allows us to um, spin up virtual meeting rooms between um, candidates and, and clients uh, for us to be able to conduct um, recorded um, screening interviews with candidates that we can then forward on to our clients, um, or just offer them the platform to to be able to do that themselves. So we started that last year. Do you um, share what it is? Would you recommend it to others? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's called Odro. O D R O. There are a um, a company from from Glasgow in Scotland, and they've been yeah doing very very well over the last twelve to eighteen months. Particularly now, the last six months or so, they've um, they've been a great help in helping to onboard remotely, interview remotely, and engage um, having that initial um, engagement with with candidates and, and clients that we can't uh, meet in the coffee shops or anything like that. And it is a really good question. Are clients comfortable with making hiring decisions virtually? Because it is new to them. Have you found that's been a blocker at all? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. Um, have you found that a client's comfortable making permanent hiring decisions virtually? Because it is very, very new. I think initially at the beginning of this, um, of the current situation, there was still a lot of um, uncertainty and companies were quite tentative. I mm -hmm. think now that most companies that I've spoken to have had successful experiences of their teams working remotely over the last two or three months in particular, it's given them a lot more confidence to onboard remotely. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when we're talking about software engineers or software developers, um, they really can do it from anywhere. Um, and businesses are far more um, inclined to, um, to to crack on with that because they can build it and get it done and, and, and equally as effectively it seems. And um, another question at, that's come in but it's perfect time to ask how do you feel about your staff working from home in the long run or do you want them back in the office as soon as possible? I think I think ideally if, if, if they might be watching so just in case. Yeah I know <laughs> if, if, if I was to be honest I'd, I'd have everything back the way it was obviously because it was you know it's it, it was, it, everything was working and it, it was brilliant so um but this has happened and it's something we need to deal with and it's something we need to move forward with and the way that the way that the guys have been my my, my staff have been since working from home has just been fantastic we you know we we've kept our processes in place with them we've we've kept the morning meetings we've kept the daily wrap-ups we've kept every bit of communication going with them. we've ring, we're ringing around with them you know, we're letting them go for their long walks with their, with their dogs or their families or whatever when they need to. Just to, but it, it is working. It's definitely working. So I think moving out of this or certainly coming out of this now, we it's something we have to accept. You know, if 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 people need to say that, you know, I, I'm I'm not ready to go into the office yet. I want to continue to work from home. That'd be fine. That, that's not a problem for us. Uh, someone's actually just asked, uh, are these are any of them actually working better from home? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I wouldn't say better. I, I think I, I, no one's really changed. We, we know that they're all 
giving everything to us 100%, you know, and it, you know in that, like they would in the office. I don't know, I suppose there, there are situations where people will feel more comfortable because they're at home and they're in, the, they're in their own environment. Our, our industry is relying on targets and, and financial targets and KPIs and stuff. If that's being hit, to me, it doesn't matter where, where it's being done. Um, have those KPIs and targets moved, and you kind of kind of talked to it, but someone's actually said, "What KPIs are you now monitoring?" You know, has yeah, have they changed? So the, so the KPIs we've drastically dropped down, really, for for the guys. So although the, 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 our delivery team and our sales team had certain targets to hit and KPIs to hit, we've kind of laxed on that totally. We, we've 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 let that go really, but we still are monitoring them. But then, when I say monitoring, we're only our monitoring is just keeping in contact. Really. Kind of lead indicators about requests that are coming in, and the, you know the the salary. I mean, because there must be those lead indicators that come into your business, right? That could go actually. Hold on, we're 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 getting an in, you know an incline now, but we could start readjusting targets. You know, what what are those sorts of things that you're looking at? Sorry, are you both? I didn't hear that. Sorry, sorry, Hannah. Sorry, I'm just saying that are are there lead indicators into your business? So you know more permanent jobs coming in or whatever that you would then go right. We need to readjust the KPIs back to what they were. Yes, definitely. Yeah, as soon as we see the the trends going climbing again, the the, the KPIs will be immediately put back in place. Thanks. Excellent. Um, I think it probably leads us my quite nicely to the future. Um, and I guess, how are you forecasting? I'm going to start on the forecasting piece of it, but how have you forecasted for the future? What do you think it's going to look like? How long are you looking? What are you guessing? What are you gauging? We, I'll, I'll let Matt talk in a minute as well. Um, we, we, we're seeing a really positive sign. Uh, we, we see it, the, the, the conversations we're having with people, they're, you know, they're, they're talking about future hiring as soon as next month, the month after. People are starting to flex now and go back in the office and then they can start really sitting down with their teams properly and having those meetings to discuss what they need to, to, for, their, for their products, for their staff, and because obviously people have been lost and, and whether it's going to be a temp market initially for the next six months, is it going to go straight into a permanent market? Um, those sort of conversations we're having and, and, and from our point of view, from, from the clients that we deal with, it, it is looking positive. See, it's interesting. See, furlough, I just, you know, the, I was talking to a friend of mine and it is in hospitality, but a friend of mine last night, who, she owns uh, a lot of pubs across the Southwest. And she said when furlough ends, they can only afford 20% of their staff. So it's like there's going to be this huge influx of candidates that's going to come into the market. It's got to impact agencies. I know that you're specialists, but how are you measuring for that impact? Or do you not, genuinely not think it will impact you? I, I honestly, if I'm honest, I don't think it's going to. Not with us. I mean, we've 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 got a really good team now of of everyone in 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 James Chase are really needed in in whatever role they're doing. They've all got their own network. They've all got their own industries. They've all got their own clients, etc. And and the back office guys, the guys that do the delivery behind that, are, are some probably the best that we have down in Brighton. So the busier that us guys, the the, the front office get, if you like. The more that we need the back office and because the, the front office me matt and, and the other guys because we know what our pipeline and what our future is looking like we know that we're going to need those guys as well so i don't touch wood i don't think it's going to really impact us that much um, i meant um, but then i so on the flip side the furlough i meant from your client's perspective of them being able to recruit directly i mean matt do you have a take on that yeah i think the i think the you know the increase in candidate availability will will affect us i think because of the niche areas in which we operate and specifically um, uh, myself in, in here in Brighton, um, it's still, whilst it's growing, it's still a relatively um, hollow market to a certain extent. So I think if we're able to stay close enough to our candidates, stay close enough to our clients and in a sense sort of, you know, sort of manage expectations and, and make the right introductions to the right people that we, we should be okay. Um, but I think naturally there'll be ebbs and flows, but because of the niche nature of uh, the competition for, for candidates, we should still be in a place where our services are, are needed. 
I mean, I think there's got to be uh, the extra validation of having to be my take on it and my spin, should I be in recruitment, would be the extra validation of having a recruitment agency. Because if you are still having to remotely interview as a, as a hiring manager, that extra validation of having been through a recruitment agency, the, re the re references, that interview process done by the professionals adds a huge amount of credibility to the hiring decision that you're making. Whereas actually, you know, coming directly in a pool of candidates, you're making decisions remotely. That's got to be a lot of pressure on a hiring manager to make the wrong decisions. So I think there's actually a real place for recruitment to back up those hires that are being made. Yeah. Would be my take anyway. Um, how different do you think your business is going to look um, to, I mean, initially what it was going to look like this year? From a financial point or? or All of it. From the team, from the team size, from the type of work, from the nature of the work, from the roles, the whole lot. It's going to change. It has changed already. It's going to change massively. Um, the way that people hire, the way that people interview, all of that process is, is probably going to change. Um, you will get situations, lots of situations where hiring managers may not feel comfortable sitting in the room with, with someone they don't know. So it'll be done via video. Maybe they won't be happy to do it that way. Um, so it is going to change. I think people will adapt and I think people are slowly adapting to the way that it is changing already. Um, the way that we work, the way that we work in our office, um, that's going to change. You know, the, the social distancing across the office. So we, are we going to put measures in place where we, we have half the office in one week, half another week for now? We don't know. So I think it's all going to change. Um, I think it's already changing, if I'm honest. These scenarios and these different <laughs> Uh, options that lie ahead for your business um, where do they currently exist do they currently exist on kind of a notepad in forecasts on bits of paper in a kind of let's see what happens week to week you know what are what process are you following to map out these different options so we, the processes we have is that James says have a recruitment process in the way that we work other, other recruitment companies work in, in different ways so we have our processes in place we have our CRMs everything's followed via that way um, so all of the processes that we have, I don't, I can't really see that changing apart from educating the end client and educating the candidates to say recruitment has to work this way now and, and that way maybe Zoom, Odro, whatever the case may be. I don't think many people can be left with a choice of that, but I think over the eight week period, I think people are getting used to this anyway, the way of communication and stuff. But for your business scenarios, where are you, um, how are you planning those? What your business actually looks like financially. Let's talk about cash flow. I mean, that's core to our hearts and it's core to, it's one of the things that has been impacted the greatest. We're planning to grow out of this. We are looking to employ some senior people when we come out of this. Okay. Some senior um, uh, people that may not be happy where they are or now feel uncomfortable where they are or, or certainly not not maybe just that someone who's who's looking for a new change because obviously what's happened over the last three four months for everyone it has made people sit back and think about what they want to do and and um and stuff like that so we're looking now to i think by the end of the year try to catch up with the money that we've lost Mm -hmm. um, and in order to do that, we need to keep our the guys we've got working, you know, fingers on pulses and stuff, and the communication channels still ongoing. But we want to come out of this in the next month or two by looking to increase, maybe with some some new additions. Really, now, I think the last couple of weeks we've already seen a little bit more, uh, or some more green shoots and a bit more positivity from our yeah. client base. We've had more jobs in over the last couple of weeks than perhaps we did over the last six or seven. Um, and it seems to be a, a common theme amongst most of the technology companies we're speaking to. I think it's obviously very early days, but um, there will be once some of the restrictions are eased, you know, a fairly sharp uplift, I think, in market confidence and, okay. um, and business levels. Um, yeah. Inevitably, I think because of the major and uh, global economic situations that will change and f for the worse but hopefully um as technology does remain resilient and companies do invest in um in, in technology we should be secure to to weather that storm and like anything you know it, it will be going up and down now for the next couple of years it's just making sure that we're still around when it goes up and that we've got um a, a tight enough niche and a, a, a 
a broad enough reach in our community to, to get through those, those downtimes. And from the mechanics perspective, when you are ticket, thinking about tickets for someone who doesn't necessarily know, Helen Wood, I will not, um, when you take on a new member of staff, you know, is there like a payback period? So, you know, that typically if I forecast X amount of salary, we should, based upon sales pipeline and conversions, have that covered, you know, so that you, you, you absolutely know, you know, in a, in a pretty confident manner that that's what should happen, money in, money out. Or money out, money in, sorry, salary out, you know, sales in. Is that how it works? Sorry, Hannah, I didn't the targets that. are the targets are um are set based generally speaking on the um top line basic salary that our consultants will be offered. So, you know, we incorporate desk costs and running costs and um benefits into that package and generally speaking, targets will be set somewhere between um three times. Yeah, you know, at, yeah, at least three potentially maybe three to five times, depending on um, the level of seniority and um, the market in which they're operating in. Okay. Um, who is supporting you guys with the forecasts and the scenarios and actually the, 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 the planning piece? Is it your accountant? No, we have a, we have a business uh, mentor uh, for myself and the other uh, co-owner. So, and, and obviously the management team as well, really. So we, we have management meetings once a week we have uh, meetings with our coach, um, uh, business coach as well, once a week. Um, so our forecasts and our plans, we know we know what our operational costs are a month. We know what we need to hit a month to achieve mm -hmm. that. And we've kind of set the office up and the staff up to, to achieve that. Great. So who is the numbers person in the business then? The, the, what, sorry? Who's the numbers person in the business? How do you mean, sorry? As in who's actually in charge of those numbers? Who's constantly playing with them and looking at them? Myself and the other co-owner. Okay. Um, somebody did ask earlier on, actually, if you guys use Futurely, and I don't think you do, do you? I think, I think Matt has. In the <laughs> it's, so, um, although someone, so the question was, so one, these are not promotions really for Futurely. So we don't, we're not picking clients based on whether or not people use our product. We're picking it on actually peer-to-peer -peer learning from within the actual sector. However, uh, we have oodles of recruitment agency that do use us. And if anybody does want to speak to me directly about how they're using us, then just please ping me and I will take it offline and talk to you separately because I don't want this to turn into a big pitch for how brilliant Futurely is at forecasting. Um, so I won't do that, but just ping, ping me and I can pick it up with you separately. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge ahead for you is? I think I think really the biggest challenge we're going to take away there just to remain positive from all of this. I think that the, the biggest challenge we're going to we're going to face is the way that people live and work now, the way that people will feel about moving from a role to another role, from a company to another company. I think really that's what we're going to really have to go our heads around and learn from and and experience because I think. I think it's just going to happen. I don't, I, don't, I don't think you can shy away from that. Obviously, you can be a bit more negative and look at other things, but to remain optimistic, like, Matt, like myself and Matt have said, you know, we are still busy. People are still hiring out there. It just depends on what, what industry you're in that, that, that is. Yeah. Um, so I think really the, the biggest challenge for, for us, and Matt might have other challenges, but certainly for the, the way that, not necessarily people recruit, but people, the way that people are going to do, um, the way that they work and the way that they want to hire. Um, I'm just going to pick up on a question which is relevant about the future, which um, Matt, you did reply to, but you replied to us, so just not to David, who oh, did. But it's okay, so I'm, I'll just pick it up, because actually it's a really good question. Um, how can you square your abnormal op optimism with warnings that from the government need leaders that we are staring down the barrel of the worst ever recession? Um, and you focus back on that fact you're in the niche tech sectors from which you believe will be able to weather the storm. Um, I guess I'd like to extend that question and go, have you modelled a worst case scenario? And what does that worst case scenario look like? The, the, I suppose the worst case scenario for us will, will, will be shrinking, shrinking, if you like, in, in, in the size of the business um, with the people that we have there. That would just literally be our worst case scenario, I think. Um, Recruitment's a funny industry. It's, it's certainly an industry that you could you could have a one man band doing it. You can you can have a, have as many people as you want doing it, and you know as long as you're successful in that one person doing it. But the people we've got in the office now are very successful in their own field and what they do. So as long as everyone continues to carry on the way that they have been during this 
this uh, pandemic, if you like, is it, I, I think will come out fine. But the worst case would just yeah, we'd have to yeah, we had slowly, uh, slowly shrink. We had a hospital one of Chin Chin in Brighton who you might know had um, he said you know I've done my worst case scenario it would be like fifty percent you know sales. Mm. I would never imagine it's going to be zero percent sales. So you know it really has been a well, as we all know a dreadful time. Uh, can we move to the next um, slide or is that? Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Thank you. we can. There we go. Yeah, so we've got some more questions, but I think, you know, some of them will be covered in, in these questions as well. Biggest learning over the past few weeks. What's it been, both of you? Um, I suppose for, for us really is to really concentrate on what our customer needs are, not necessarily recruitment, not pushing hard on the sales, not pushing hard on... When we talk to people now, Anna, we don't talk about hiring we talk to them about you know how their business is coping what they're up to what their future plans are like just just general conversations i think really that's what we've really had to adjust to and learn and will from. that continue do you think that approach will that you know um it will for existing clients obviously we'll have to go out and find other clients which we do always anyway um but for the existing clients that aren't hiring it's, it's keeping those communication going with them to say look we're still here if you need us but you know give us a call if you need help with other things or other than recruitment and um, you know, i don't I, think sorry matt Carrick, sorry sorry i think if, for me personally the biggest learning over the last few weeks has been kind of the willingness and um uh, of people that i had had very little contact with before their willingness to to help and engage mm -hmm. and kind of and, and, and do more basically. And, and a lot of the work that we did early on in April um, for, for Silicon Brighton, I was quite overwhelmed with how many people we were speaking to whilst we we're going through you know, a terrible time that wanted to contribute their time, wanted to, to help. And um, that's been really positive. And I think it speaks volumes for particularly the local market here in Brighton, mm -hmm. the community and the, the sort of spirit of, of, of collaboration that people are showing. And, you know, do you wish, as we've said top three things, is there anything that you wish that you'd done before this lockdown happened? Personally, I wish I had a haircut. But <laughs> we just need to put your profile picture back on. It's basically the same t-shirt, but with shorter hair. I don't know, yeah, I think I've got uh, <laughs> six weeks by, by Boris's uh, rules. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I think it's in demand with everyone. We've actually got hairdressers as the vertical we're covering next week. And I think oh, it's right. an awful check. thing where they know there's going to be an absolute boom as soon as their doors do open because we're all around the corner, aren't we? Yeah, we've had a few um, uh, DIY attempts that we've uh, have given us some, some laughs on our weekly Zoom calls. So I thought they scared me off enough that I'll wait until they open. <laughs> so, Phil, anything, you know, in all seriousness, is there anything? <laughs> that you've done I, I suppose really if we were to look back I suppose really having a bit more of a remote and flexible way of working with the guys I suppose I think if you look back on things maybe we could have flexed on remote working because we were very much although we've got staff that have children and staff and can only work you know certain hours of school runs and things like that we you know we did let them have that but I think I suppose really looking back now I suppose having a bit more of a flexible way of working in the way that we came into this, we were right at the, the, the point when it all started. So we had them at home then anyway. I think the week before the lockdown happened, we'd done three trial days with everyone at home. And yeah. the first day, I think there was a few tweaks with systems you had to sort out. But after that, everything went really smoothly. So. I think it's got to be a silver line that's come out of this. I think it's forced us all to completely change so that mm. nine to five, clocking in, clocking out, the mm. core hour thing that exists in recruitment, you know, your 10 to 12s. It's just all gone now because yeah. actually people aren't sitting at the desk. You've not got to, you actually haven't got, I mean, recruitment, I guess you haven't got the gatekeeper. I guess that's improved life. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, is there anything? What would be your top recommendation to anybody else in recruitment? Because there are there are actually a load of other recruitment agencies on this call. Um, I think on niche as well. You know, if you just think about the, the industry. Yeah, I think I think what what we've come out of this as well is we we. I mean, I'm I'm born and bred from Brighton, and I know most of the recruitment companies down in Brighton anyway. And I'm I'm proud to proud to be friends with some of the other guys who own who own the other recruitment businesses and. And, um, you know, having communication, is not, don't make it so competitive anymore, if you like. Just have share ideas, share experiences mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I think that's really helped us at James Chase. Um, we've learned a lot from other companies and stuff. And if, if, if those guys would want to go out and come and ask us what we've experienced, we're, we're more than happy to help and, 
and share ideas. I mean, we're all in this together at the end of the day, so it's, yeah. it's, it's certainly something like that I, I would. And, and keep, keep positive and stay, you know, stay in touch with your staff, just, just keep in touch with your staff as well. Yeah, positivity is definitely key. And, you know, the old phrase kind of inch wide, mile deep is, is definitely really helpful at the moment. Becoming immersed in your in your community, becoming immersed in your niche and yeah. understanding that on a, on a level where you can help people um, and, uh, and make, um, you know, uh, important contributions to that community is, is also really valuable at the moment. Um, so hopefully um, we're, we're helping to do some of that. And would you say, have you have you witnessed or would you advise maybe recommend you know looking into niches you know if, if for generalist you know recruitment firms that that actually that could be a way a way to diversify um, what they've already been doing in the past. Absolutely, I think most of the recruitment leaders that, that Phil would have just mentioned and those that I've worked in the past and spoken to, the most successful ones will be those that that have a niche and have managed to um, really focus on that in anger and, and, and carve it out properly. Um, I think the generalist recruitment agencies will probably be the ones that will be suffering the most at the moment, I guess, I guess um, and would have seen the, the loss of, of most of their people. Um, but if you've got a niche, then you're and you can be a respected contributor into that market, um, then I think you've always got a place. Sure. I agree. And I remember back in 2009, the way that you won was the senior roles, because actually people are looking to hire strategically and they need people to drive these businesses forward. And that's what happened to us is the average salary. I mean, this is a long time ago was, you know, where we were placing people at 50, 60, suddenly went up to doing the 80, 90 Kers, because suddenly that was the market that's moving. And it's just recognizing where those movements are happening, isn't it? Yeah, um, staying close to that market, you, you get the, um, you get the intel and the insight as to, as to where you need to be more quickly. I'm, I'm really conscious of time. Uh, Hannah, you can see, you can see the Q&A box I can't see. So are there any questions in there that we need to cover before we wrap up? Or are there, are there anything you're going to do before you reopen the office? Just final, final question from here and then we'll move to the questions. Anything we're going to do before we re reopen? Before you, you all go back into, because you, you know, you're still open, right? But is there anything yeah. you're going to do before, apart from the haircut? Which <laughs> Um, so I suppose really it's just it's, it's the obvious stuff really so more making sure the office is, is safe to to open um, we've already opened it so um, uh, we, a couple of us have been in there already um, just to purely get away from home um, <laughs> but um, yeah certainly um, just to check you know, what we need to get done to make sure the office is safe for the staff to come back in we want to make sure that the staff are happy to come back in um, and yeah, just making sure the systems are back up and running and tested and the phone systems are working. And stuff. Yeah. Okay, right, questions, there are a few. Um, and one of them, I'm not sure that I will understand, but you three will. Um, so most recruitment business models are based on a percentage of the salary plus OTE of the hired candidate, um, which leads to the uncertainty of the cost for the client. Do you think in this crisis, perhaps a project fixed fee based not necessarily higher or lower than the percentage model, maybe more attractive for clients in those times. Yeah, potentially. I think we've already started to introduce various models into the um, solutions that we offer. So um, we do offer um, a service whereby we put one of our people uh, before this on site, or we'd offer a, a, a fixed fee over amount of hires over a particular time uh, based on the size of that project, um, as opposed to just one bum on one seat and a, and, a, and a fee on that basis. So definitely, um, depending on the client needs and the scale at which they're looking to recruit, sometimes if there's multiple hires, a fixed fee project basis might be better than a fee attached to every person. And we understand that and it's a model that we do, we do offer at the moment. Um, another one, we kind of covered it, but you know, just the development of pipeline. Do you, would you say that that's still happening in that in the traditional sense, or is it just happening a different way? How are you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's more, um, I would say, kind of laser focused short term in terms of the development of the pipeline at the moment, as opposed to managing a team of, of 16 and, and looking at, you know, the average levels of, of what they're bringing in is difficult at the moment so how we can measure their output is you know we track everything on crms we do have daily calls and we make sure that um everything that we're um every job that we're bringing in or candidate we're speaking to is well qualified all the notes from the system and we're communicating effectively still to that extent it hasn't really changed how we measure output um same systems and, this, and just a reduction in metrics really um i mean i can't believe this clanger here thanks thanks john for asking this one but do do you think that Brexit will impact your business when it happens? I thought we'd gone off that one. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, 
uh, uh, it, it, it had done already and it will continue to do so. I mean, we were able to bring over quite a lot of talent from, from Europe uh, previously. Um, very good developers over the continent once it comes to the UK. Not so much anymore. Um, so um, we've had to work harder about how we, how we find people, um, introduce technology and offer engineering perspective, you know, analyze the open source repositories more. Um, but, um, but that's not, I'm surprised it's kind of gone off my agenda at the moment, actually. But um, it has a lot of people. Oh, it was, I think. Yeah, let's get Funny through that. this first now. But um, yeah, it has done and it will continue to do so. But there is a, a big enough community in, of, of, of um, you know, of technologists that we work with in the UK that we'll, we'll be able to work with. It was um, a good question I did see, actually. So sorry, because I, I stopped saying that. Credit control, how are you ensuring your invoices are actually being paid on time and yeah. promptly? So um, some of them aren't being paid on time. So we're doing a lot of um, credit chase and um, invoice chasing and stuff. So credit control is something that we're doing daily now. Um, but it, I think we haven't touched on this really. I think the, the conversations we're having with our customers and our clients about the money that's overdue and, and the money that's owed to us, is not really necessarily a, we, need, we need the money. It's more of a how are things going and it's it's kind of like bringing the relationships a bit closer to each other really we're more invoice insurance which is completely different from invoice factoring or invoice finance yeah. not the same thing and you guys looked at that we we don't we don't need that no we have it, we we do have invoice uh, discounting for our That's temporary not. workers yeah. and invoice insurance is something that's supplied by the banks anyway oh it is so you'll you're guaranteed the cash flow to come in it's, we're insured by a little, yeah, okay, to a certain okay. level. To a certain level, because that is something for a lot of recruiters, I think, that actually yeah. is a, a new credit control process. It could be really yeah. good for brand new invoices that are raised. Um, final question, final, final. I've got, well, I is it? Say, is but it's the same one. What do you look for in an account? Oh. <laughs> so, what, yeah, what, I mean, it's quite a phrase, accountant, accountant for a recruitment firm like yourself. Um, so we've had our accountant since day one really, so our accountant, uh, what do we look for? We look for um, uh, competitive, obviously, um, but someone that can do the full package for us really, from the payroll all the way through to supporting us. Um, so we, we look for local, because um, we would rather them to be local and ideally yeah. with a recruitment industry background as well. And how often would you look to sit down with your, how often would you like to see your accountant and talk to your we, accountant? We see them, well, we did see them quarterly. So we, we sat down quarterly with them. But then I guess you've got your business coach who probably fills yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the um, our accountant, we tend to sit down quarterly. Okay. And would you, is it more compliance focus and your advisor, your coach is more for strategic and planning? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Nice, thank you. Honestly, it's been we've had a very engaged audience, which has been brilliant. You two have both been fab. Um, and I think that probably answers my um, question of we should do the questions as you go through because yeah. that was the point of the LinkedIn thing is that you get a really engaged crowd if you do questions. So thanks for proving that theory right, everyone listening. Um, but thanks for your honesty. Um, you know, it's you know it is putting a business out there, but as you said, I think it's this peer to peer learning at the moment is incredibly valuable and we absolutely can ensure that we're all still here and we can get back to the good times that we had in Feb if we all work together, share ideas and all evolve to this new world that we find ourselves in. Um, for anybody on the call, we have got another recruitment session tomorrow that's actually with an accountant uh, who is a, coming at a recruitment business and how he is managing them through their numbers and through forecasting. Um, they're based up uh, in the northeast, so the other side of the country. Um, but same time, you, I will share links, obviously, with everybody who's in this particular session. But you guys, best of luck over the coming months. Thank thanks, you for Helen. your time. And Bye. thanks for everyone for joining thank us. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.